Hello, everyone. Who's here? Um, good evening. Um, I hope everybody is having a good time um, here in Portland. It's an absolutely miserable, gross, uh, disgusting, disgusting uh, evening, uh, which makes it a great time to talk about the Pinkertons. Uh, I'm super, super excited about this talk. There's a lot to say about the Pinkertons. There's a lot of things going on here. And I hope that uh, you will uh, enjoy it as well. Oh, good morning, Rakar of Oz from Australia. Um, you're not allowed to talk, though, because you guys are on lockdown. But please enjoy uh, the lecture. Uh, I appreciate you tuning in. Um, I guess like a little bit of uh, content warning. Obviously, there's going to be some talk about murder and strike breaking and a couple of distressing images, um, just a heads up. Uh, I assume that if you're tuning in, you're probably aware and moderately comfortable with these things, but I, I do want to kind of like let you know. Um, and without further ado, I am going to jump into it. So let us talk about the Pinkertons. So uh, this all begins with um, a man named Alan Pinkerton who was born in Glasgow, Scotland, uh, in the late 18th century. Uh, Pinkerton emigrated to the United States in 1842. Um, he moved to the Chicago area in 1843. Um, and uh, he was initially a cooper. Uh, he made barrels, um, chopping down wood and making barrels. Um, but as early as 1844, it seems that Pinkerton worked with or for uh, the abolitionists in Chicago. Um, and his home in Dundee near Chicago was a stop on the Underground Railroad. This is interesting, uh, and we can uh, just bear that in mind as we go forward. Um, according to the story, according to Pinkerton and, and the histories, he became interested in doing uh, crime work while he was wandering through the, the wooded groves around Dundee looking for trees to make barrel staves uh, when he came across a band of counterfeiters. Um, he observed their movements for some time um, and then informed the local sheriff who arrested them. Um, this relationship led to Pinkerton being uh, appointed the first police detective in Chicago uh, in Cook County, Illinois. Um, he arrived at pretty much the perfect time for this. Uh, the population in cities in the United States was booming, especially in places like Chicago. And American mayors, uh, aldermen, city councils, uh, people of importance, uh, had a lot of new problems. And they needed, uh, well, they thought they needed professional police forces to help them keep order. Um, if you were around for my talk on modern or the origins of policing, you might remember that these were not not exactly America's finest. Um, many, including Chicago's, were inefficient. Uh, they were plagued with um, the save, same corruption that affected many other parts of the American government during this sort of golden age of spoils. Um, many politicians viewed their new police forces as just another tool for patronage or grift. Uh, they were also underfunded a lot uh, because this was a age of rolling bank and stock market crises, and there was usually one uh, catastrophe after another. Um, so income independent agencies. So private citizens and business owners would often turn to these uh, independent agencies uh, to uh, basically like 19th century rent-a-cops um, who were more loyal and, frankly, reliable than the actual cops. Um, by the 1890s, the market was flooded with uh, independent police forces. There were 22 agencies in the 1890s operating out of Chicago alone, uh, 58 by 1918. There were 17 in Philadelphia and 20 uh, out of New York City. Uh, generally, these agencies offered two separate um, 
services. There were private detectives who would investigate cases and, uh, you know, find criminals and things like that. Uh, and then there were protectives who were just uh, private uniformed police forces, basically security guards. Uh, Pinkerton had both. Um, he got some high-profile business from the railroads in the late 1850s. Uh, he helped them track down and apprehend some train robbers, uh, which connected him to a railroad executive named George McClellan, um, who, in the middle of the Civil War, actually ended up being one of the most, if not the most powerful men in the U.S. military. You've probably heard of him. General George McClellan. Um... Which led to Pinkerton uh, occupying a special place in Civil War history. Here you see Pinkerton with Abraham Lincoln himself. Uh, the guy on the right is uh, General John A. McClernand. Um, and when the Civil War began, Pinkerton served as head of the Union Intelligence Service during the first two years, uh, heading off an alleged assassination plot in Baltimore, Maryland, while guarding Abraham Lincoln on his way to Washington, D.C. Now, credit to uncovering the plot, however, really goes to Kate Warren, uh, a female detective, uh, the first female detective, I believe, in the United States, who was hired by Pinkerton. Um, under the aliases of Mrs. Cherry and Mrs. M. Barkley, Warren tracked suspicious movement of the... Baltimore secessionists, uh, and went undercover under the guise of, uh, and I quote, a rich southern lady visiting Baltimore with a thick southern accent that apparently Mrs. Warren uh, used to infiltrate social gatherings, uh, places such as the classy Barnum Hotel, uh, posing as a flirting southern belle, uh, and quickly verified that there was a plot to assassinate Lincoln and developed details of how the assassination was to occur. Uh, General McClellan uh, admired the zeal and thoroughness that uh, Pinkerton exhibited during this railroad detective work uh, and put him in charge of scouting operations for the Union Army during the Civil War. Um, here's the thing. Pinkerton was really bad at this. Uh, he actually sucked. Um, he was good at detective work. He was not great at military intelligence. Um, he didn't really know how to count large bodies of soldiers, and he was worse at determining, determining their movements. Um, as a result, Pinkerton routinely exaggerated Confederate army sizes and worse, incorrectly predicted the enemy's intentions on many crucial occasions. For example, uh, even though McCle McClellan could have crushed the Confederate's lines during the Battle of the Seven Days or Antietam, he hesitated due to Pinkerton's faulty intelligence, which told McClellan that the general was facing way more troops than he actually was. He also, and ooh, ooh yikes, missed uh, a very important plot, uh, the one concocted by John Wilkes Booth and his conspirators to actually assassinate Abraham Lincoln. Bummer. Um, however, this did not stop Pinkerton from continuing to uh, make hay and uh, work himself in to the fabric of American society. Uh, after the Civil War, uh, following Pinkerton's service with the Union Army, uh, he continued to work for the railroads, pursuing train robbers, including the Reno Gang, uh, which carried out the first three peacetime train robberies in the U.S. Uh, he arrested the, the Pinkertons, uh, his agency, which had grown to uh, hundreds and thousands of agents by now, um, did arrest a handful of members of the Reno Gang, uh, but most of the money they took was never recovered, and ultimately what stopped the gang was a series of uh, vigilante lynchings. Uh, when they were grabbed off of the prison transports and hung by um, angry people in Indiana and Wyoming. Uh, he was hired by, the, by other railroad companies to track the outlaw Jesse James, um, but he repeatedly failed to capture him, uh, and the railroad withdrew their financial support, and Pinkerton was forced to continue tracking James at his own expense. Um, and this continued for the middle of the 1870s. Um, in uh, March of 1874, two Pinkerton detectives and a deputy of sheriff encountered the Younger Brothers, who were part of the, the James Younger gang. Uh, the deputy, one of the Younger Brothers, and one Pinkerton agent were killed. Uh, in Union, Miss Missouri, a bank was robbed by the gang, and a Pinkerton detective who trailed them was killed. 
1875, Pinkerton detectives threw a bomb through the window of the house that Jesse and Frank James lived in. Uh, but Jesse and Frank weren't at home, uh, but their mother was, uh, and it blew off her arm and killed their younger half-brother. Uh, not great. Um, a little bit later, James uh, allegedly captured and killed one of Pinkerton's uh, undercover agents uh, who was working undercover at a farm near the James's family homestead, and Pinkerton uh, abandoned uh, the pursuit in disgrace. Uh, those of you who are familiar with the movie um, The Assassination of Jesse James by the Coward, what is it? What's his name, Ford? I'm forgetting it. Anyway, as you will well know, James was not taken down by the Pinkertons. Uh, he was shot in the back by one of his dudes. Um, Alan Pinkerton died in 1884, but he passed the business on to his sons, uh, and it was only growing, and it was expanding rapidly into a new line of business, union busting. Um, he was, according to Terwilliger Van Buren, he was shot in Northfield, Minnesota. Uh, which sounds right. Town of cow cows, colleges, and contentment. I'd love to hear it. Um, so during the mid-19th century, hard coal mining had become, uh, come to uh, dominate northeastern north Pennsylvania. Uh, and by the 1870s, there were powerful financial syndicates who controlled the railroads and the coal fields. Uh, coal f these coal companies... Uh, recruited uh, immigrants from overseas willing to work for less than the prevailing local wages paid to American-born immigrants. Um, they were lured by promises of fortune-making. Um, if this sounds familiar, it's because, well, they still do that. Um, at the time, however, most of these immigrants were Irish, Welsh, Scottish, um, really like a lot of Irish. Um, and in the mid-1870s, there were around 22,000 coal miners working in Schoolkill County, Pennsylvania, uh, 5,500 of which were children between the age of 7 and 16, uh, and they all earned between $1 and $3 a week, separating slate from the coal. Uh, miners who were injured or too old to work uh, were assigned to picking slate at the breakers where the coal was crushed into a manageable size. Um, and this is a quote from a report about uh, the conditions. Uh, the mine owners, without one single exception, had refused over the years to install emergency exits, ventilating and pumping systems, or to make provision for sound scaffolding. In Schoolkill County alone, 566 miners had been killed, and 1,655 had been seriously injured over the seven-year period uh, leading up to the strikes that we're about to talk about. So enter the Molly Maguires. So... That's these fellows here. Um, the Molly Maguires uh, originated in Ireland, where there were all these secret societies with names such as White Boys and Peepote Boys, uh, which sort of cropped up in the early 18th century uh, and persisted through the 19th century. Uh, originally, they were involved in uh, populist actions like uh, attacking um, Irish landlords, but also they became increasingly involved in labor disputes. Um, in Pennsylvania in the time, there was a, a l official legal self-help organization for Irish immigrants called the Ancient Order of Hibernians. Uh, but this was probably a front for the Mollies. Um, again, I, 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 I'll come back to this, but there's a lot that we don't know about the Molly Maguires and the Ancient Order of Hibernians, and there's a lot of um, deliberately misleading history around this. Uh, that have been that has been built up to make the Mali seem uh, violent and extreme. You all know where my sympathies lie, but uh, just know that the history is contested here. Um, so the the Mali's were present. Sorry, the Mali's are believed to be present at the anthracite coal fields in Pennsylvania in the as, uh, since at least 1873. Um, this is not proven. Like there's there's no proof that the the Mali Maguires were involved, but they probably were. Um, but in 1873, uh, there was a panic, um, one of the worst depressions in the nation's history caused by uh, economic overexpansion, a stock market crash, and a decrease in the money supply. Um, those of you who have been at, <laughs> I, I feel like I've, I've talked about this multiple times, but it had to do with the 
German taller and uh, changing the currency involved in a, a whole series of just over speculations and railroad nonsense. Uh, anyway, uh, a bunch of rich people did a dumb bunch of dumb things, and then the ordinary people suffered. Um, so this is the the backdrop for the the Molly Maguires. Um, so at the time, Frank Gowan was the president of the Philadelphia and Reading Railway and one of and the Philadelphia and Reading Coal and Iron Company. Um, and by 1873, uh, he was convinced that uh, of the necessity of lessening the overgrown power of the labor unions in Pennsylvania and exterminating the Molly Maguires. Um, in 1874, Gowen uh, led the other coal operators to announce a 20% pay cut. The miners decided to strike on the 1st of January, 1875, and in response, Gowan brought in the Pinkertons. Um, starting in 1876, members of the Mollies were accused of murder, arson, kidnapping, and other crimes, uh, in part because of allegations by Franklin Gowen and the testimony of a Pinkerton detective, James McFarland, who was Irish himself. Um, the railway trusts and other companies uh, focused seem to be focusing on or have been focused on the, the Molly Maguires for criminal prosecution. Um, McFarland passed information uh, to the, the industrialists, uh, which then somehow, curiously, made it into the hands of vigilantes, who then ambushed and murdered miners suspected of being Molly Maguires, as well as their families. Um, during this time, Pickerton wrote to um, his general superintendent, about the Molly Maguires, saying that the Molly Maguires are a species of thugs. Let Lyndon get up a vigilance committee. It will not do to get many men, but let him get those who are prepared to take fearful revenge on the Molly Maguires. I think it would open the eyes of all the people, and then the MMs would meet their just desserts. Uh, shortly afterwards, three men and two women were attacked in their home by masked men. Um... The history of the Molly Maguires is sometimes presented as the prosecution of an underground movement uh, that was uh, more about personal vendettas, uh, maybe a, a struggle between organized labor and industrial forces. It's not clear whether membership in the Molly Maguires overlapped with union membership because it was a secret society, and a lot of them got killed, and uh, we never really found out. But um, the Pinkertons were there, they were cracking down, uh, and they made a name for themselves as... Um, labor enforcers, which they kept on doing. Um, in 1872, the Spanish government hired Pinkerton to suppress a revolution in Cuba, uh, which was intended to end slavery and give citizens the right to vote. Um, Pinkerton was, again, ostensibly an abolitionist and claimed to be pro-labor, though he was against strikes. So it's not clear if he knew this was happening, but the Pinkertons were definitely there. Um, during this time, the coal and iron police were established in Pennsylvania, uh, which was just sort of a subdivision or supervised by the Pinkerton de Detective Agency. In 1877, there was uh, the Great Railroad Strike, uh, which you can see here, a bunch of people getting shot, uh, strikers. Um, and in Reading, uh, in 1877, uh, Reading was the head of... Um, or sorry, the home of the engine works and shops of the Philadelphia and Reading Railway. Uh, during the strike, the National Guard shot 16 people, um, and the in order to stop the National Guard from being complicit, uh, the uh, authorities brought in Pickertons and other private forces to continue to break the strike. They did this several times throughout the 1870s and early 1880s, and it culminated with the Homestead, homestead Strike. Um, so the 1890s were a good time for steel, um, and especially for Carnegie Steel, uh, which was incredibly profitable. Uh, Andrew Carnegie had come up with uh, a new steel-making method uh, that made him very, very rich, and that... Um, was was a genuine technological innovation. I, I have nothing good to say about Andrew Carnegie, but I will say that compared to modern-day industrialists, he appears to have actually invented something or 
finance the invention of something that was valuable. Uh, his steel production process was was better than what came before. Um, and uh, Carnegie was making a lot of money, especially uh, from a lot of things, but especially from selling steel plate to the U.S. Navy for their warships. However, wages for his workers kept dropping. Weird. Um, the main union involved with Carnegie's uh, steelworks was the Amalgamated Association of Iron and Steel Workers, um, and they represented a, a substantial portion of workers uh, in Pittsburgh and surrounding areas like Homestead, Pennsylvania, which is just six miles from Pittsburgh. Um, in 1892, negotiations between the Amalgamated Association of Iron and Steel Workers and Carnegie broke down, and Carnegie's man on the ground, a guy named Henry Clay Frick, was instructed to break the union. Um, again, publicly, Carnegie said he was pro-labor, pro-union, but he seemed to be against this union, which is weird. Weird how that keeps happening. Everyone says they're pro-union, except not this union. Anyway. Um, so... Um, Carnegie announced a 22% pay cut, uh, and uh, the union didn't want that. The union was locked out. The plant was surrounded by a fence. Towers were put up near the mill buildings uh, and private security. Notably, the Pinkertons were brought in. Uh, the strike committee issued a direct declaration which said, The employees in the mill of uh, Mr. Carnegie, Phipps, and Company at Homestead, Pennsylvania have built there a town with its homes, its schools, and its churches, and have for many years been faithful co-workers with the company in the business of the mill. They have invested thousands of dollars in their savings in said mill in the expectation of spending their lives in Homestead and of working in the mill during the period of their efficiency. Therefore, the committee desires to express to the public as its firm belief that both the public and the employees aforesaid have equitable rights and interests in the said mill, which cannot be modified or diverted without due process of law. That the employees have the right to continuous employment in said mill during efficiency and good behavior without regard to religious, political, or economic opinions or associations. And that it is against public policy and subversive of the fundamental principles of American liberty that a whole community of workers should be denied employment or suffer any other social detriment on account of membership in a church, a political party, or a trade union. That it is our duty as American cities, citizens to resist by every legal and ordinary means the unconstitutional, anarchic, and revolutionary policy of the Carnegie Company which seems to evince a contempt for public and private interests and a disdain for the public conscience. So things came to a head uh, in early July in Homestead. Um, Frick intended to open the works with non-union men on July 6th. Uh, scabs. Uh, Knox devi devised a plan to get the um, Pinkertons onto the mill property um, since it was surrounded by striking workers, the agents were going to get to the plant um, from the river. So 300 uh, Pinkerton agents uh, assembled on the Ohio River, uh, just below Pittsburgh. Um, they were given rifles and placed on two special barges, which were towed upriver by a tug. Uh, they attempted to land under cover of darkness at about around 4 a.m., um, a large, however, a large crowd of families had kept pace with the boats as they were being tugged. Um, some shots were fired. Uh, the crowd tore down the barbed wire fence, and the strikers and their families occupied the homestead plant grounds. Um, as the Pinkertons attempted to disembark, shots were fired. Uh, there's conflicting testimony uh, about which side fired the first shot. Uh, those of you who are here for here for my Haymarket talk will remember that this is also. Uh, a consistent theme. Uh, anyway, uh, in any case, uh, the New York Times claims that the Pinkertons shot first. Uh, the Pinkerton agents aboard the barges fired into the crowd, killing two and wounding 11. Uh, the crowd fired back, killing two and wounding 12. Uh, the firefight continued for about 10 minutes. Um, the strikers then took up positions behind the pig and scrap iron in the mill yard, while the Pinkertons uh, hunkered down in their barges and they cut holes in it so they could shoot back and forth. Um, the tug departed with the wounded agents, leaving the bre barges stranded. Um, the strikers set up a rampart of spe steel beams so they could fire down on the barges. Um, hundreds of women crowded along the riverbank between the strikers and the agents. 
uh, calling on the strikers to kill the Pinkertons. Um, six miles away in Pittsburgh, a bunch of steelworkers heard accounts of the attack at Homestead and armed themselves and began to move toward uh, Homestead to assist the strikers. Uh, the strikers um, uh, set their own ships on, like, fire ships up and sent them down towards the barges. They found a cannon and fired it at the barges. They threw dynamite. They poured oil onto the river to catch it on fire. Um, unfortunately, none of this really worked. But eventually, the Pinkertons had had enough. Uh, they raised the white flag and surrendered to the strikers, who disarmed them and let them leave, though a lot of them were pretty badly beaten on the way through. Um, so briefly, the Union had won. Uh, however, uh, shortly after this, the state militia was called in, and they're much more organized. Uh, they arrived in town without uh, giving the Union time to, to get together. They occupied the plant, uh, and they brought in strike, bre strike breakers, restoring production. Um, a few weeks after the initial battle, uh, Alexander Berkman, uh, an anarchist who lived in New York uh, and Emma Goldman's lover, uh, tried to assassinate Henry Clay Frick, but fucked it up real bad. He tried to stab Frick, and, uh, and he survived. Uh, and this turned public opinion pretty harshly against the strikers. Um, the strike collapsed, and ultimately the uh, pay cut went through. Um, and yeah, I wish I could. I wish I could like give like a any like good news here, but now they th this is a big L for the American labor movement. It's pretty bad. Uh, it's not all bad though, uh, because. Uh, this was a time when apparently it was still kind of a bad look to murder um, protesters. Uh, and so uh, even though the ultimate outcome of the strike was was what, you know, most of the industrialists and the authorities in the United States wanted, uh, it still didn't look good what the Pinkertons did. So Congress passed the Anti-Pinkerton Act, uh, which in 1893 which limited the government's ability to hire private investigators or, or mercenaries. And it's right here. It just says an individual employed by the Pinkerton Detective Agency or similar organization may not be employed by the government of the United States or the government of the District of Columbia. Um, pretty straightforward. This is pretty clear. It's even called the Anti-Pinkerton Act. Um, however... As I'm sure you're not surprised to hear, that didn't really stop the Pinkertons from continuing to work for the government. Um, they just did so in somewhat more, oops, getting a little ahead of myself, in a little bit more circumspect ways. Um, the government hired them sort of surreptitiously, uh, and more often they were just brought in by private companies. Um, I wasn't able to find a ton of in the way of detail, but the, the Pinkertons were involved in just about every labor dispute for the next 50 years, from the Pullman Porter strike to the Ludlow Massacre to the Battle of Blair Mountain. Um, in Ludlow, they worked directly with the National Guard. Uh, agents evicted workers and attacked their camps. Uh, the National Guardsmen set fire to the camp, which included a women's infirmary. Um, 66 people died, uh, many of them women and children. Um, I'm glossing over a ton of stuff. I could spend, I could do it a whole lecture on the Molly Maguires, on Ludlow Massacre, on the Homestead Strike, on all of these things, uh, and I probably will someday, but um, try to focus on the Pinkertons here, and it's interesting that they have their fingers in all of this. Um, in any case, when private industry needed unions infiltrated, intimidated, or straight up broken, Pinkertons were their guys. Um, however, it wasn't always smooth sailing for the Pinkertons. Um, this is Ernest D. Lernay, assistant to the president of Tennessee Coal Iron Railroad Company, testifying before the La Follette Civil Liberties Committee, um, which was created after the National Labor Relations Act of 1935, um, which was the last time that the United States gave a shit about labor. Um, in an effort to employ the best suited labor management system between unions and employers, uh, the NLRB uh, was established to sort of like govern these things, and uh, the f one of the first things they did was uh, was put up this committee, um, run by Robert La Follette, a Republican and Progressive Party senator from Wisconsin. Yes, that's right. You heard me correctly. Republican and Progressive Party. Um, 
maybe some other time I will talk about the political realignment of the parties, but I know you're smart people and can figure it out, but just bear in mind. Um, in the late eight 1930s and early 1940s, the subcommittee published exhaustive hearings and reports on the use of industrial espionage, private police agencies, strike-breaking services, um, arms used in industrial warfare, and... Uh, Employers' Association's attempts to break strikes and disrupt legal union activities. Uh, the committee investigated the li la five largest detective agencies, the Pinkerton National Detective Service, the Williams J. William J. Burns International Detective Agency, the National Corporation Service, the Railway Audit and Inspect Inspection Company, and the Corporation's Auxiliary Company. Um, every single one of these uh, attempted to burn their records, uh, in order to avoid being caught. Uh, however, there was enough put together to, uh, to make the report make sense. Um, the committee reported that as late as 1937, uh, its census of working labor spies from 1933 to 1937 totaled 3,871. Uh, it was revealed that the Pinkertons especially had operatives in nearly every union in the country, including the UAW uh, and every major uh, union that existed at the time. Uh, unfortunately, the Follett Committee didn't actually implement any meaningful legislation. However, it really did piss a lot of people off. Uh, people were not happy about um, the infiltration and uh, subversion of unions, and so a lot of these companies uh, took things in a different direction. Um, so Pickertons don't stop existing after this, but they, they pivot. Uh, and they pivot to risk management, as it turns out. Uh, this is uh, the modern uh, Pinkerton website uh, where they list all sorts of things, uh, and they are all sort of on the aegis of, again, risk management, corporate liability, um, you know, protecting assets. It's all very vague. Um, the... The website also, you know, mentions the history of the Pinkertons, but it, it weirdly uh, uh, avoids uh, any of the, like, more uh, um, unsavory things. Um, they've got a timeline of Pinkerton agency sort of events and history, and there's just sort of nothing at 1892. Um, so they get out of the business, theoretically, of just union busting, um, and do this for a little while. Um, they... Um, help corporations evacuate their... Oh, oh yeah, they still exist. Don't worry. Uh, I, I hope uh, you're excited for the, the denouement of this talk because um, th this is good. I, I normally, you know, try not to, to go all the way up to the modern day, but this is too good for me to, to not... Um, for me to not uh, uh, follow through on. So for the mid latter part of the 20th century, they don't do a whole lot. Um, but... Uh, at one point, they escort the Mona Lisa as it is uh, taken from one place to another. They help uh, evacuate employees from danger zones. Um, anyway, um, in 1999, they are acquired by Securitas, uh, which is a Swedish security firm. Um, and uh, at this point, sort of like a... a mega private security corporation. Um, Securitas acquires Pinkerton, Burn Security, and some other regional security companies in the United States in an attempt to um, expand. Um, full disclosure, I actually worked for a Securitas subsidiary at one point in my life. I was a uh, unarmed security guard. Um, and they suck. They're real bad. It's an absolute garbage company. It's the McDonald's of private security, which is really bad. It's already bad. Anyway, um, but they're a mega mondo corporation. They employ like 500,000 people. Um, no, I was not a mole. I was not that advanced. Uh, and I would not recommend that anybody try to go into Securitas to be a mole because it's, like I said, like a mega corp uh, and you'd have to work your way up. Um, it's anyway, um, but they were making a move into the United States. They acquired the Pinkertons. Uh, and the uh, it's interesting they also acquired um, Burns Security, which used to be sort of a, a major rival of, of the Pinkertons, uh, to the point where I think they tried to, like, had actual, like, gun battles. 
Um, there's a lot that I haven't been able to talk about. There's just like so much going on with the Pinkertons. Anyway, um, so the Pinkertons still around, still working, um, and they'd like you to believe that they're they're just involved with risk management, whatever that means. But mm, is that really true? No, it's not. It's not really true. They're still at it. Uh, in 2018, The Guardian reported that Google and Facebook have both retained Pinkerton to monitor staff for leaks. Um, among other services, Pinkerton offers to send investigators to coffee shops or restaurants near a company's campus to eavesdrop on employees' conversations. Uh, Pinkerton claims that its agents typically focus on uh, intellectual property theft, insider trading, trading, but it's possible that the firm's reach does not end there. Uh, the Guardian found that several former Pinkerton investigators have been hired by Facebook, Google, and Apple. Um, that same year, Frontier Communications, uh, a telecommunications company in West Virginia, hired Pinkertons uh, during a workers' strike to um, provide security services. Um, in a legal complaint, the Pinkertons complained that the striking workers had abused them. Um, imagine that, like, muscly corgi meme and the sad, weak corgi meme, you know, previous day Pinkertons, modern day Pinkertons, anyway. Um, in October, uh, a man was shot and killed in Denver while counter-protesting a Black Lives Matter rally. The shooter, a man named Matthew Doloff, had been hired by the local news station Denver 7 to provide, is it not a corgi? What kind of dog is it? Oh, it's a doge, sorry. The Doge is a Shiva, sorry, my bad. Um, hired by the local news station Denver 7 to provide security for its staff members at the protest. Um, I, I'm not saying good things or bad things about uh, the shooting of the protester. Uh, the trial's still going on. Just letting you know that the Pinkertons are providing private security for news corporations. Um, in November of this year, uh, an investigation by Vice revealed that they had acquired documents showing that Amazon analysts closely monitor the labor and union organizing activity of their workers throughout Europe, as well as environmentalist and social justice groups on Facebook and Instagram. Um, they also indicate, and an Amazon spokesperson confirms, that Amazon has hired Pinkerton operatives to gather intelligence on warehouse workers. In Poland, in, in a Amazon warehouse facility in Poland, Rocklaw, Poland. Rocklaw? I don't know. I don't know how to say Polish words. Um, Pinkertons were explicitly sent to infiltrate the union there uh, and find out what they were up to. Now, uh, I'm not saying anything one way or another beyond this about the Pinkertons. Everything that I have told you so far is public knowledge and reported elsewhere, and I am not going to speculate uh, on whatever else the Pinkertons might be doing uh, because they are still a company and I don't want to get sued. I'm just letting you know that I think it's very interesting that the Pinkertons are still out and about and they still appear to be involved in the exact same sort of um, corporate uh, anti-union activity that they were 150 years ago. Um it's interesting to me, and, and I am just going to sort of waffle here because, uh, you know, I don't, I don't have, like, I don't have a particularly, like, uh, neat bow to put on this. Uh, like Terwilliger Van Buren set up there, they did have kind of a cool start, and, like, before the union busting, they did a lot of, like, protecting of railroads and fighting against, you know, Wild West gangs and stuff like that, but truth be told... The thing that made the Pinkertons famous and wealthy and allowed them to be acquired for $400 million by Securitas AV in 1999 was their anti-union activity. That was what really like made a name for them. And they were absolute thugs. Um, you know, a lot of the Pinkertons who were at Homestead didn't even know what they were doing. Uh, they'd been you know, deputized and handed badges and uh, basically the same day. Uh, and the Pinkertons... Um, they would take just about anybody uh, in the, the 19th century, anybody willing to uh, to work for them. They were not an elite detective force. They were often a bunch of jackbooted thugs. Um, so 
I guess, like, more broadly, it's kind of interesting that um, the Pinkertons have been, you know, they're, they're, uh, they really are like American as apple pie. They've been there uh, at uh, the Civil War and, and all throughout our, our nation's history and all the, all the big <laughs> all the big labor L's throughout uh, the last couple hundred years. Um, and they're still around. And, you know, I, I think that they are trying to rehabilitate their image, and I think they prefer to not be associated with, um, uh, you know, what they used to do. Uh, a girl, Alex, asks if they had a, a private eye in the door. I, I Did I show you? I, I showed you all the thing at the beginning. I, I haven't made a point of this, but, like, their motto is, we never sleep. And they've got like an eye. It's still that. It still looks like that. It's kind of creepy. I don't know. It. It. Uh, you know. It does not. I guess like, maybe if you're, like a corporation, that's uh, you know, reassuring. Uh, as an ordinary person, uh, it causes me a great deal of stress and alarm. Anyway, um, it is good branding. It's it's honestly like it's pretty rad. Um, so, yeah, um, I, I feel like they're, they've been in the news, like, more often in the last few years than they used to be. I think they were really trying to, um, shake their reputation, but, uh, I guess a leopard can't change its spots. Uh, old, can't teach it an old dog new tricks. Pinkerton's got, um, <laughs> one core competency, and that's union busting. Uh, so yeah, so thanks everybody for tuning in. Uh, I hope the new time was not too, uh, disorienting. I I'm thinking about doing it this time of day so that, um, anybody who wants to like tune in and then, uh, go out once we're able to do that again, I uh, will be able to. And also, so I can, I don't know, seven was weird for dinner. Um, so anyway, thanks for tuning in. This was fun. Um, Everything that I said is reported elsewhere, and um, if I said anything that was libel, then imagine that I said alleged before it, um, and if any Pickertons are listening, I'm sure you're all very cool guys. Don't do, don't come after me. All right, everybody, have a good Friday night. Uh, stay healthy, stay safe, uh, and I'll see you all next time.